Good morning, PTO Nice Daily Show. How are you? Welcome to Clinical Tuesday. My name is Dr. Lindsay Huey, Lead Faculty for Extremity Management, along with Dr. Mark Gallant and Dr. Eric Chaconis. So excited to be with you today, as always, on my favorite day of the week. Today, I'm going to talk with you about pain and performance. But before I dive into that topic that I'm so excited to share with you a little bit about, I'd love to tell you about some courses that Extremity Management has coming up. So April 1st and 2nd, there are still spots at Elite Ortho. So we'll be in Nightdown, North Carolina, which is just a short drive from Raleigh and lots of good eats um, there. So join me and Kristen Nett um, if you have time that week and we'd love to see you. Mark's actually on the road that same weekend, but he sold out. Um, so you can check him again um, in May, May 20th and 21st. He's with the Onward Tennessee crew. That's such a fun place to host a course and really close to Nashville. So those are our two most recent open courses coming up. We'd love to see you. Otherwise, check out ptonice.com to see other listings that will be around the country. Um, we have a lot of new West Coast additions, so a couple in California, both North and South End, and then an Arizona course I think is going to be coming up too, so be on the lookout. So the topic at hand, pain and performance. So I was really inspired um, to chat on this topic um, because of a hump day hustle that went out a week or so ago um, on a podcast that Lorimar Mosley and Ebony Rio shared on BGSM. So they were really talking about pain in the context of athletic performance. Um, but it really got me thinking about how we can help influence the pain experience for the better in all of our patients, right? It doesn't have to be a competitive athlete. Um, it could be a grandma, a mom. Um, could just be someone that likes to lift weights recreationally or an industrial athlete, right? Someone that works in a factory um, that's injured. Um, but all of those scenarios requires performance, right? To do that job well, whether it's just activities of daily living and playing with grandkids or kiddos um, or doing the job at hand. And so I want to share with you a couple practical tips, <clears throat> two steps that we can um, proactively do to help manage our patient's pain experience better. And so we don't get such inhibited performance. I do want to briefly review um, the effects of pain on performance in general, and then I'll dive right into those two tips. So what we see when you look to the literature and what was discussed in that podcast a little bit, that both in acute and chronic pain stages, right, whether it's acute injury or an injury that's been around for six months to a year, we'll see reduced cortical motor excitability. Um, that's measured by transcranial magnetic simulation. So basically when in pain, we see this reduction in motor performance and or neuroplasticity. So that ability to adapt to our surrounding environment um, in a salient way. So changes in motor performance might be reduced accuracy, or precision in a task, or maybe reduce speed um, because of um, pain inhibition. And so we see reductions in aspects of skill and or we see avoidance of certain motor patterns or strategies due to fear of maybe re-injuring, right? Someone might avoid, someone that's had like a meniscal injury might avoid um, knee extension and twisting for fear that that movement um, might cause re-injury. But there are a couple things that we can do proactively um, to just help patients manage and prevent the sequelae of the effects of pain on performance. And it really comes down to giving them a realistic framing of their injury and then just a really resilient mindset. So I really want to unpack that for you now. So step one. We need to acknowledge where our specific patient is in their healing and rehab journey. And specifically, where are they at in the tissue healing part? It doesn't matter whether it's acute or chronic. Everyone has a very individualized um, pain experience. And we have to acknowledge that. I want to use um, the meniscal 
injury as just an ongoing example of what I mean by this. So let's think about someone that had a meniscal injury acutely, like three weeks ago due to a twist versus someone that had a meniscal injury one year ago. That person with that meniscal injury three weeks out that's coming to see us that's in a lot of pain, it's our responsibility to give some guidelines for range of motion, for example, right? That we want to maybe in those initial stages, three to six weeks, limit it to about 90 degrees in those first three weeks specifically. Um, teaching a solid quad set, right, to combat reflex inhibition. And then um, getting them to perform mini squats to about 60 degrees to protect that healing structure. Versus someone, it's a year ago that they hurt their meniscus, tore their meniscus, but they're still in pain. And in that case, right, letting that person know that that tissue structure has healed at this point, right, that progressive loads are appropriate, progressive loads and ranges, and we don't need such protective mechanisms around movement versus that acute stage. You may be that person that for the first time in that person that's a year since meniscal injury that says it's okay to move. It's okay to move confidently and throughout the range. Healing timeframes, I think we know them as PTs, but it's our job to be really transparent about expectation and kind of what's normal in those healing stages. Once our healing parameters and safety buoys are established with expectations about movement progress and progression, we can move on to the next step, which I think is the most important step that we sometimes could do a better job with. And that is building a resilient mindset and how they interact with movement and their rehab experience. Mental and psychological preparedness is key here. And there's going to be a couple sub-steps to this second step. So first, acknowledge that your patient, whether it's an acute or more chronic injury, that there's always going to be some preconceived thoughts, beliefs, and feelings about that injury. And we first have to assess what our patient is feeling, thinking, about their pain experience and their injury, because it's our role to validate that experience because each individual is complex. And then it's our job to also dismantle any thought viruses um, that will stand in the way of recovery. So it's first, let's assess where their mental and psychological state is about their injury, whether it's acute or chronic, right? And if we think about the meniscal injury again, think about that person that maybe hurt their knee a year ago, knew they had a meniscal tear, and it was associated with doing deep squats. And in their mind, they believe they'll never be able to squat deeply again, or with the amount of load that they used to do before, right? This is a thought virus that isn't true. It's our job to assess that and then dismantle that as being um, set in stone. The other thing is that association that pain always equals harm, right? Sometimes just letting the patient know that pain doesn't always equal harm is a really empowering thing to say. Think about, again, acute meniscal injury. They're afraid to bend their knee just with gait, right? And just to do initial um, contact and then moving into swing phase, is okay to move through that range, right? And to move through it normally. And just giving permission that person maybe three weeks after injury that they don't have to walk like a mummy in knee extension, they can bend their knee and that's okay. Versus someone chronic meniscal, right? A year ago, they hurt their knee and they fear um, that if, again, they squat deep, that it'll cause harm. So just letting them know that those overprotective um, mechanisms aren't necessary. They can move with more freedom. So we have to help them recognize what signals of the body are overprotective and give them some freedom outside of those. The other thing is retrain their system to be less protective. So we have to give them rehab, right? Exercises that help them feel confident. If we think about what I just gave the example of um, gait training with more knee flexion, have them do some gait training, right? With you in the clinic where they realize, oh, it's safe to bend my knee. It's safe to bend with a little knee knee bend and initial contact. I don't need to um, 
go into extension and protect this knee. Right. And the person that's afraid of squatting really deep with heavy loads, have them start squatting deep in a progressive way with you in the clinic to show them that it's safe. Rehab's role, right, is to help um, promote thoughtless, fearless movement. If we do what Louis Gifford said, that's really one of our main tasks. So giving them those retraining tools, let them know um, that they'll continue to build on that range, whether it's acute or chronic. And then as their tissues heal, right, we'll, we'll keep progressively loading. The sub-step two that I want to review in this two-part thing, right, making a resilient mindset, and I think might be the most important part. It's not just letting the patient know what movements are safe, calming down overprotective um, movement mechanisms, but helping the patient interact with other folks about their pain experience in a better way. And this is what really inspired me um, from the podcast most with Laura Moore Mosley and Ebony Rio. Because Laura Moore Mosley really talked about how one of his athletes kept being asked about, how's your knee pain? How's your knee pain? And in a whole day when they tracked, it was like over a hundred times that people had asked this gent about their pain. And Laura Moore Mosley gave him this one simple tool that I would encourage us all to give to our patients. He said to tell others, I'm adapting, I'm on the pathway to recovery. I'm adapting, I'm on the pathway to recovery. This is a powerful shift in the narrative, you know, where we become obsessed with pain and thinking pain equals harm. This sets a tone where pain is not the focus, that rehab and recovery are moving within that buoy system of safety that we've created for them, whether it's acute or chronic, if that can be more of the focus, right, that will help that pain experience um, be less invasive. If we can teach our patients how to frame their rehab differently in their brains and then to others, those effects of pain on performance will be dampened. We need their mind sharp and then the minds of others that interact with them. If we've done that, then I think we've done something really great and impactful on the pain experience. So in summary, we know that pain will reduce motor output and performance. Let's minimize the effects proactively via two practical guiding steps for our patients. We need to retrain protective mechanisms, both physically and mentally. So it's step one, in summary, is acknowledge where your patient at is they're in their healing and rehab journey. Whether it's acute or chronic, educate on healing timeframes and expectations with direction in each stage. Step two, create mental and psychological preparedness for rehab. And this comes through clear direction of how to think and modulate the pain experience. Discussing what's normal, what's not. And then how to even frame it for others. Shepherd your patients through an injury with these two purposeful steps to reduce the effects of pain on performance. Join me next Tuesday, because this is just part one of a two-part series where I'll discuss pain, performance, and then connection. And so you can learn how patients' close connections and their tribe also affects their pain experience. Happy freaking Clinical Tuesday, everyone. I hope to see you next week. Thanks for your time this morning. And I thought I turned that off, but I didn't. <laughs>